we are simulating 100, 100 hours and we are looking at the utilization rate and, and queue size uh, for, uh, for this. Uh, I'm, I'm only going to be focusing on a few of these rows here. So if I run a simulation now, and I, I might also add that in this simulation, we start collecting data from after 20 hours, so the results might be uh, slightly different. The good, there's a good reason why we might want to start gathering data only after a number of um, iterations, and it's the fact that to some extent we're looking at a system that is cold, and then once the system warms up, we have a scenario that is more realistic and reflects better reflects the state of things when you when you look at the system at the at a given point during the operations. Whereas if you look at the system in the very early iterations, of course all the queues are going to be empty. And if there's any asymptotic sort of behavior, you're going to miss that uh, completely. And if your simulation is too short, um, what happens at the beginning of the simulation might impact greatly the data you see. Uh, coming out of the of the simulation, so that's why you might want to uh, have this sort of uh, start gathering data only after the first few iterations. In our particular case, because we're going to push the number of iterations to a thousand very quickly, we don't mind too much that we're gathering data for those twenty iterations. But so what we're going to be focusing on is let's check what's the overall number of uh, elements uh, processed by looking at what number of uh, output queue size we see on the on the sink, so on the final machine, which is M4. And let's focus on the utilization rate and the and the queue size, okay? So if I run the simulation now, um, we can see uh, something, something very interesting. Uh, X and Y are still used at 100% utilization, which is never, never a surprise, again, unless the queue is, is a limited size. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have uh, different data for M1 and M2. Now, this, this is where, where things get interesting. So M, M1 is utilized for less than 20% of the time. It means it's mostly idle. M2 is utilized for 30% of the time. And then M3 uh, is utilized uh, on 54%, and M4 is almost at capacity with 98%. Now, ideally, we want a system that is loaded all almost all the time so with a... With a utilization rate, which is as high as possible, maybe not too close to 100 because we want to keep some flexibility, we want to be able to uh, handle um, spikes in the utilization. Of course, if we maximize all our, over all our, our machines, then the time where we have a spike, then things are going to uh, possibly break badly. But I want to uh, point your attention to the fact that we have, look, we have a total number of uh, number finished is after 100 iterations, again 80 in this context is 133, in our case because we have 20 iterations more that's uh, 159. And then we have a number of X processed and number of Y processed that is um, you know, uh, different, so it seems like one process is producing more uh, items than the other one, which is uh, process Y, so Y process Y is, is faster at generating items. Uh, and then um, what else can we can we get out of this? We can get the fact that, again, both, both M1 and M2 are underutilized, M4 is at capacity, so that's it. So the question, so uh, looking at the queue size, we can notice that the queue outside of M2 and the queue outside of M3 are both um, quite, uh, quite busy. There's 20 elements in one and 20 in the other one. I'll show you a graph uh, explaining this uh, in a visual way. So this is the queue performance, and it shows you, um, in this case, the average and the maximum number of items in each queue. In our case, we're just looking at a snapshot of that data, so we're looking at the number of elements in the queue at the end of the simulation. But you can see how very easily you could keep track of that and then compute the average and the maximum um, uh, in the, as part of the simulation as well, right? But if you look at that, after 100 iteration, we have M2 and, and M sorry, M2 and M3 uh, growing in size. And this might be something we need to be wary of. Uh, if I run another simulation, yeah, we have this interesting scenario. We have um, M2 is producing, M2 produces into, let's double check, look at the diagram. M2 pushes the values into Q4, and uh, Q4 is uh, 18 elements, and then Q4, 
five is actually 12 elements. So there's some sort of weighting happening. Uh, partly it's because M4 cannot cope with the, with the load, but it, there might be more to it. Okay, so one thing that the uh, lecturer suggests here, looking at the, at the data is, could it be that the reason why we have so many elements uh, showing in the, in the system is that uh, we're not simulating for long enough. So maybe if we go from 10, so from, from 100 to 1000 iterations, then we're gonna start seeing different behavior emerging. And so before starting to change the setup of our system, let's try and see if increasing the number of, of iterations changes the, the patterns that we've seen so far. The pattern we've seen so far is there are queues accumulate starting from um, the output of uh, machine two and getting into and starting and in the output from machine three. So I'm now going from a th for a thousand iterations and we see a very similar pattern, right? So even if we went for a thousand iteration, the pattern is still there. So elements at the output of M2 and M3 gets queued up. Now, the output of, of M3 goes into machine four. So one consideration we could, uh, we could make here is, what if we were to double the amount, the, the capacity of our system at the very, um, at the very end and increase the number of uh, machines that can read from uh, the output of machine three. So what if we were to add an extra machine uh, reading from, uh, from Q5? And that's a, that's, a, that's a good idea, right? Especially because it doesn't cost us anything. We're just simulating this stuff. So because we have these 172 elements in Q5, the thinking here is, well, if I have an extra machine, then I'm gonna be able to process more elements, right? So let's, let's do exactly that and let's see how easy it is to add an extra processing, uh, machine processing here. So it's gonna be very similar to machine four. Let's call this M4A and this is called M4B because they're in the same stage in their process and everything else is exactly the same. We're, we're running at the same rate. It's exactly an identical machine and it's reading elements from Q5. So same, just exactly the same. So we just need to remember to add M4B to the, to the system, and then we can write, run another simulation. Okay, so very interesting. So it looks like, uh, mind that when we're looking at the output of M4 and, and, M, and M4, M4 A and B, it's the same output because we're pushing to uh, the sink. So what we see is the number of elements in the sink. So we, we processed, finished processing um, 1800, around 1800 elements, we still have a queue that is growing over time in our system. And it's what happens at the exit of M2, which is a very interesting piece of, uh, of information. So we have 